tonight on CBC Vancouver News. So it would be a very travel for me. Transit trouble. Contract talks with SkyTrain workers collapse also. I'd be much more satisfied if Mr. Vagramov would be transparent with the community. Charges stayed. Port Moody's mayor will not be prosecuted for alleged sexual assault and being able to tell our own stories for like people to hear because like there are still like a lot of stereotypes. Indigenous students learn about journalism at CBC's Junior J School. This is CBC Vancouver News. Good evening. If you use public transit in Metro Vancouver, there is another reason to be concerned tonight. After six months of negotiations, contract talks involving SkyTrain workers collapsed this morning. It's happening as transit operators are threatening escalating job action as their talks get back on track. Eva Yuguen Senj is live tonight outside those negotiations in Surrey. So Eva, how's it going? Well, there's been little change here as we wait to hear whether both sides have reached a compromise and they may be back at the negotiating table, but transit troubles are still haven't let up across Metro Vancouver. There are more than 200 alerts for cancellations today, and it's only expected to get worse if these talks don't go well. The list goes on. Bus routes in Vancouver, Surrey, Burnaby, New Westminster, all over the Lower Mainland dealing with possible cancellations. Not to mention the six cancelled sea bus sailings this evening. For the most part, Surrey commuters haven't noticed a big change in service. But they are paying close attention in case they need to find another way of getting around. I think there's no changes in here. But I heard from the news, but in here, in sorry, but I think it's not uh, affected or what. Personally, just that the uh, operators aren't wearing the uniform, that's all that's affected me. So timing, delays, none of that has been an issue? Not for me, now. Are you worried that it's going to be as... For sure, yeah, because I'm basically dependent on transit. Every time it's going to be missed due to such strikes, so on a transit, you're showing like the bus, the bus is missed due to some cancellations. And I am going to the Capilano University too, so the C bus is also getting missed. But there's more potential trouble for transit users. Separate talks, negotiations between the union representing 900 SkyTrain workers and their employer, the BC Rapid Transit Company, have broken off. Though SkyTrain won't be impacted in the immediate future. We deal with uh, a lot of overtime uh, to keep the system running, and um, that comes down to inadequate levels of staffing. The SkyTrain Workers Union and Unifor work for separate employers, the BC Transit Company and the Coast Mountain Bus Company. They both operate transit services on behalf of TransLink. TransLink has a dirty little secret. It doesn't treat its workers fairly. It divides them into separate companies and then tells them not to pay attention to each other. The SkyTrain Workers Union will talk to its members this week. The earliest there could be a vote and possibly a strike mandate is late next week. Until then, SkyTrain service won't be affected. West Coast Express and Canada Line are also not affected at the moment. Meanwhile, talks are still ongoing between Unifor and Coast Mountain Bus Company. We'll be keeping a close eye on it all night. The two sides have been behind closed doors here all day with no sign of when an agreement will be reached. Anita and Mike. All right, Eva. How about you, Gwen Senj, reporting live tonight from Surrey. Thanks. Well, the sexual assault charge against Port Moody Mayor Rob Vagramov has been stayed, meaning he will not be prosecuted further over an incident that took place when he was on a date. Special Prosecutor Michael Klein stayed the charge because Vagramov has successfully completed an alternative measures program. Here to tell us more about this is our Municipal Affairs reporter, Justin McElroy. So, Justin, does alternative measures mean he's been cleared? Well, it means that, that this won't be going through the criminal system, but it doesn't mean that nothing happened. So as you said, this was a date in 2015. A charge was put against Vagramov for it in March. He had been on leave for much of the time since then. But alternative measures is a system that the B.C. government sets up for a certain number of incidents as a way for it to go through something other than the court system. So here's a list of 
ways that it can be used. In certain situations where the charge against you is considered a minor one, if it's your first offense, if you admit that you're responsible for something and you apologize to the complainant about what you did. As for what happens next and the steps that are taken, sometimes it can be compensation for the loss or damage, sometimes it can be an apology, sometimes it can be community service. It's pretty broad on the provincial government's website of how this works. The question people are wondering is what did the mayor of Port Moody admit to? What was his apology like and what did he did? And for right now, we don't know. His lawyer said they won't be revealing that. The BC Prosecution Service won't be either unless under a court order. So at this point, the system has played out the way it does, but there's still lots of questions for people in Fort Moody. Okay, so how are people reacting to it? Well, Mayor Rob Bagramov himself, we put forward a request for comment today. He has not gotten back to us. Uh, thus far, we spoke to Councillor Diana Dilworth. She's been the councillor perhaps most critical of the mayor during this process. She says that she's happy that there is a resolution and that uh, the city can begin governing with a full council slate, most likely once again, but says that the mayor still has more to explain to the community. I'd be much more satisfied if Mr. Vagramov would be transparent with the community. Uh, because of this charge against him, our community's been tarnished, our community has been torn apart, and uh, I do appreciate that he's made amends with his victim. I think it behooves him now to make amends to the community. But we'll see what he says. He hasn't even said yet when he will return to be mayor of Port Moody, though he has promised in the past he will do so once this is cleared up. But certainly lots of questions we don't know, and it's up to the mayor to choose whether or not to answer them. Municipal Affairs reporter Justin McElroy. Thanks, Justin. The man who died last night in a fire in an industrial building in East Vancouver was in the wrong place at the wrong time. That's according to Vancouver firefighters who believe he was staying late to work in a building on Pandora Street at Woodland Drive when a fire broke out in a compressor room and spread quickly. The older building had no sprinkler system, but investigators say it did comply with fire code. It's a very, very, very difficult uh, night. Um, the crews take this kind of thing uh, very hard. Uh, obviously, we want to save people. That's our job. And when that doesn't go well, it, it, it hits the crews hard. Exact cause of the fire? still under investigation. The brother of one of the first women to speak about sexual harassment in the RCMP is fighting for her legacy tonight. He's calling on the federal government and the RCMP to find a way to honor his sister, Krista Carley. She ended her own life last year. Our Dan Burrett has more on this live tonight. Dan, why is Carley's brother doing this? Partly because Krista's bid for compensation wasn't processed before she died, and a $100 million class action settlement is only for living officers. So, as of now, Krista's children will get nothing. Krista Carley shared her experiences with CBC News after her colleague Catherine Galliford spoke out in 2011. Carley said she endured almost 40 instances of sexual assault, harassment, and bullying by coworkers and superiors. She also lived with PTSD and left the force after almost 20 years with a medical discharge. Her brother, Kevin Carley, says it's less about the money and more about the federal government acknowledging Krista's contributions. It's very simple. It's her legacy, her memory. I mean, uh, it seems that all the hard work that she did served so faithfully for just under 20 years in the RCMP and then carried on the torch helping victims uh, for a number of years afterwards, uh, incurring illness as a direct result of her service with the RCMP. And so I, I just don't think it's fair that her legacy be left dangling with a question mark on the end of it. Okay, Dan, so how would Kevin like to see this all resolved? Well, he's looking for some kind of legacy project in her honor. He's open to suggestions. One of them could be a direct apology to Krista's family beyond the general apology that the RCMP offered many of its members in 2016. Anita, Mike? All right, Dan, thanks very much. The provincial government is set to announce wide-ranging regulations on vaping products on Thursday, that's tomorrow, to help deal with skyrocketing youth vaping rates in this province. Health Minister Adrian Dix, Education Minister Rob Fleming and Finance Minister Carol James are to announce regulatory changes, tightening access to vaping products and education plans. The announcement will be made in Victoria tomorrow morning. It is expected to be the most substantive plan in Canada. 
Clinics on Vancouver's downtown east side are providing drug-free options for chronic pain management to help fight the opioid crisis. The DTES Chronic Pain Service offers physiotherapy, counseling and other treatments without the use of opioids or any pain medication. First of its kind pilot project launched back in February and was created for those living in poverty. One regular patient says this approach to pain management has had a huge impact on her life. It changed my life. I was afraid to move before. We have movement classes here. I come and I move freely and I have pain relief. The program has already reached its capacity of 200 appointments a month. A $24,000 bronze statue stolen from the doorway of an art gallery in Vancouver last week has been found safe and will soon be returned. This photo posted to Reddit was taken while the statue was being recovered. Staff had feared the 160 kilogram sculpture would be melted down and sold for scrap. Vancouver police say no suspects have been arrested and the investigation is ongoing. Home sales are up and prices are rising across our province compared with this time last year. The BC Real Estate Association says the number of units sold in October 2019 rose by almost 20% over October of last year. Average sales price across BC rose 5% from a year ago to $724,000. It says most markets across the province are returning to a more typical level of sales activity. Well, the day wasn't so bad today, but I think Brett is here now with some bad news for tomorrow. Well, I think I do want to emphasize how good of a day this was. This was actually spectacular. I was forecasting for a little bit more cloud than we got today, but certainly it was a nice sunny one, and it felt really like a nice November treat. Yes, there is going to be some rain on the way, but it's not going to be happening until essentially later tomorrow evening, perhaps into the overnight period. And as far as today was concerned, a live look at our satellite and radar, you can see, well, there's just no rain. And it was just a little bit of cloud going on here or there and temperatures right now all the way across the lower mainland still quite comfortable between seven and eight degrees and I was looking at some of the stats today Vancouver Harbor was actually one of the warmest places in all of BC right about 13 and a half degrees and it's not official yet but it looks like that might have broken a record from back in 1967 in terms of where our lows are going to be going tonight well they're not going to be that low at all we're not going to be seeing a significant budge in temperatures especially toward the downtown core but perhaps toward Toward Burnaby, New West, Richmond and Surrey, we could get down to some of the low, maybe mid single digits. But in terms of our rain, this is the story that I do want to emphasize and preface for for the end of the week. We're going to be looking at clouds largely building in throughout the evening into the overnight. A few peaks of sun are possible first thing in the morning, but by the afternoon, that's when it's going to get a little dicey. Good chance for some showers right around the evening dinner time hour. And then by about midnight tomorrow, that's when I've got some pretty good confidence that we're going to be in for a decent amount of rain. All right, thanks very much, Brett. You're welcome. Well, across Canada, Indigenous people are underrepresented in a number of fields, including journalism. Well, today, CBC Vancouver hosted a special workshop for aspiring young journalists. This was the fourth Indigenous junior journalism school here at our studios. And as Leanne Young reports, the event is aimed at opening doors for students. Hi, I'm Sydney Fowler. Hello, my name is Sean LaRochelle. Hi, I'm Ashley. You're watching Junior J School News. One by one, they took their shot. More than 150 Metro Vancouver students, all with Indigenous roots. I'm from Trondequichin, Lake Manitoba, and Ebonflow First Nations. Um, and I'm also from Trondequichin, and my dad is Métis. I'm Kwakwakwa and West Sowetan from Smithers and Port Hardy. I'm a uh, Métis, I'm a writer, actor, and I'm attending the Indigenous Junior J School. A chance for students to experience firsthand what happens behind the scenes, guided by some of this country's leading journalists. You also want to emphasize things and put some pauses in there so that it sounds really interesting to listen to. Hi, my name is Isaac Williams from Twaston First Nation. You're listening to CBC Radio 1. That's 90.5 FM in Victoria. Oh my God, that was so good. Discovering hidden talents along the way. The event aims to open the door for more Indigenous journalists. 
5% of Canadians identify as Aboriginal, but a study from Laval University found fewer than 2% are in media. For somebody like myself who grew up not just not seeing any Indigenous journalists, but not seeing any Indigenous stories ever, opening up the newspaper, seeing nothing, seeing silence, not having any of our voices heard, and to see all these young kids wanting to be Indigenous journalists, tell Indigenous stories or other stories, it's incredible. I was thinking like that should be changed. Burnaby North student Hannah Carr is looking to break through that dire statistic. Us being able to tell our own stories for like people to hear because like there are still like a lot of stereotypes and like negative images that are pushed like alongside Indigenous people. It's not unfamiliar territory. The 16-year-old comes from a family of storytellers. Let the spirit take control of the soul. Her stepfather is one half of today's star attraction. Despite being a rap star and not a journalist, Darren Metz says at the end of the day, it's all about sharing Indigenous stories, a movement that's snowballed since the 2016 Idol No More movement. It's now a lot more people are open about learning the history and like the raw history that this country has. And, you know, that's the first step when it comes, like, especially when you talk like reconciling and reconciliation. Advice he's passed along off and on stage. Have pride in who you are, have pride in where you come from, and have pride in what you do. Much love. That love was felt all around today in a lesson that extends beyond the confines of J School. Never give up on what you want to do. Well, yes, it was a busy place in here today. It was great, so yeah. to see all the enthusiasm with the students, everybody was really into it. Yeah, they were up here on the set for a while. They mm -hmm. were doing a lot of stuff. The workshops really, really good. Yes. And just a reminder, mm -hmm. you can watch this newscast live on CBC Gem. The free app is also where you can find other CBC programs. And CBC Vancouver is also on Facebook, YouTube, and Instagram. Well, it was a day of drama on Capitol Hill. The public impeachment hearings kicked off, and there were some bombshells. The revelations next. And thanks for staying with us online during the TV commercial break. No commercials here, of course. Okay, this week... <laughs> Sesame Street, this is hard to believe, kicked off its 50th wow. season. Yeah. And to celebrate the milestone, CBC sat down with puppeteers who worked on the Canadian version, Sesame Park, to reflect on the show's legacy and working with creator Jim Henson. Hi, I'm Tim Gosley, and I played Basil the Bear on Canadian Sesame Street. Oh, no. This exercise is making me hungry for cookies he was a polar bear and uh he he kind of spoke like this i'm basil the bear here and uh he he was a l loving smart in a very naive way kind of guy I can't breathe either and i can still see the cookies i'm trish sleeper and i worked on sesame park the characters i did were Katie, a little girl in a wheelchair. Good morning. Katie, the reporter here, about to interview that famous, fabulous fairy tale legend, Goldilocks. She sort of had a voice like this, probably. Something like that. <laughs> and my favorite and most honored character, Barbara Plum. The Notebook with Barbara Plum. Good morning, I'm Barbara Plum. Today, a special report on the word hat. Working on the Canadian Sesame, uh, Canadian Sesame Street uh, was probably one of the most fun parts of my career. We take a trip together to the moon. We go exploring. I think as a puppeteer, it's hard not to be inspired by Sesame Street. It was a breakthrough television event. Big. Really big, like me. We were very fortunate to be able to have that opportunity. Being part of Sesame Street I I is kind of self-evident. It is iconic, so uh, to be on it is such an honor. And to have worked with Mr. Hansen was, you know, uh, unbelievable. Uh, so you know that you've been part of something that's 
even 50 years later, is still embedded in everybody's mind. Uh, it, it's, it's really special. There's not many shows that have done that. They tried different things that, than had been done in children's television up to that point. And uh, it was breakthrough. Bye. See you later. Yeah, nice to see that. I don't think... Uh Necessarily, a lot of people remember there was the, the Canadian no. version. No, I'm trying to think series. back and which one did I watch, but I recognize a lot of the characters. Some of those characters so, as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right, stay with us back uh, in just a couple of seconds with the latest political headlines, including the impeachment hearings from the U.S. in just a second. Charged public testimony today for the first time at the impeachment inquiry in Washington. Lawmakers heard about what's being called highly irregular communications with Ukraine. Democrats allege President Trump used American diplomacy for his personal political gain. But as Ellen Morrow reports, Republicans have been quick to refute that. Bill Taylor, the acting U.S. ambassador to Ukraine, and George Kent, a top State Department official, expressed their alarm as they say it became clear that U.S. military assistance to Ukraine was being held up to pressure Kiev to investigate Trump political rival Joe Biden and his family. To withhold that assistance for no good reason other than help with the political campaign made no sense. It was it was counterproductive to all of what we had been trying to do. Uh, it was illogical. It could not be explained. It was crazy. Taylor also revealed new information, telling investigators that one of his staffers overheard a conversation between U.S. Ambassador to the European Union, Gordon Sondland, and President Trump. Taylor says his staffer asked the ambassador about the phone call, and Sondland, a political appointee, said President Trump cared more about investigating the Bidens than he did about Ukraine, a strategic ally. Just down Pennsylvania Avenue, President Trump dismissed the hearing. I'm, I'm too busy to watch it. It's a witch hunt. It's a hoax. I'm too busy to watch it. The president says he hasn't watched the hearings, but he tweeted video clips of Republicans defending him during the proceedings. Some of the Republican exchanges with the witnesses were fiery. Mr. I was not wrong about what I told you, which is what I heard. That's all I've said. I've told you what I heard. And that's the point. What that's you heard did not happen. So Republicans on the attack, while Democrats say the testimony backs up the allegation that President Trump abused his power for political gain. This is just the first in a series of televised hearings. We'll hear from former U.S. Ambassador to Ukraine Marie Ivanovich on Friday with more testified hearings scheduled next week. Ellen Morrow, CBC News, Washington. After testimony wrapped on Capitol Hill this afternoon, Donald Trump held a news conference with the visiting president of Turkey. The U.S. president was asked about today's impeachment hearing. Are you talking about the witch hunt? Is that what you mean? Is that what you're talking about? I, I hear it's a joke. I haven't watched. I haven't watched for one minute because I've been with the president, which is much more important as far as I'm concerned. Uh, this is a sham and uh, shouldn't be allowed. The leaders were also asked about Turkey's purchase of a Russian air defense system, which has angered the U.S. and other NATO allies. Trump says the purchase created serious challenges, but he hoped they could be overcome. For his part, the Turkish leader says it's time countries around the world take back their nationals who are ISIS detainees. And he says Turkey could repatriate a million refugees to a safe zone in northern Syria. And while the current U.S. president is being investigated in Washington, D.C., a former one is getting a much warmer reception in Halifax. As Colleen Jones reports, Barack Obama's event has generated a lot of excitement. For Gabriella Patel, Huang Maduk, and Azibo Jang, hearing Barack Obama speak is a dream come true. This place, this is Nova Scotia, has a strong African Nova Scotian community that identifies with Africa. So it's a homecoming for both Barack Obama, but also for the African migrants to come and join their family here and hear such a great speaker. How excited are you guys to have tickets? 100%, like 120. Moment. Even back home, my mom is like, you have to just take a picture with him or meet him, just gain something from this as much as you can. 
The 9,000 tickets to hear Obama speak, they sold out in record time. Sold out in 22 minutes. And you weren't surprised? And we had a waiting list of 3,400 people. Amazing. Amazing. That's Diane Kelderman from Nova Scotia's Cooperative Council. She wanted a big name for their 70th anniversary. Well, I wouldn't say it was a lot of pestering, but I would say it was a lot of persistence and determination. We started uh, two years ago, actually, with the ask, and it took 18 months to get to a yes. Were you rejected a couple of times? I wouldn't say rejected, but probably discouraged. Uh, you know, there was many times when it was his, uh, you know, speaking schedule is full. He has no other plans to be in Canada. Uh, he's going to be spending time internationally writing a book. So there was certainly an indication you know, go away, he's not going to come. <laughs> but here he is. But here he is. Retired Senator Don Oliver is recovering from surgery, but he was not going to miss this night. It's incredible to have him here. He uplifts people so much. And uh, I'm looking forward to hearing him answer the questions tonight. And, and there are going to be a lot of uh, African Nova Scotians here. And I think he'll be saying some things to them and encouraging them, giving them hope and so on, which is his message, and it's going to be exciting. I, I'd met him before. I met him in, in the White House, in the Oval Office, when he was president. And to hear Obama speak is something he didn't want to miss. Colleen Jones, CBC News, Halifax. A rally today in support of Don Cherry, but not very many people showed up. After the break, the latest on the former Hockey Night in Canada co-host.
Here are some of the stories we're following tonight on CBC Vancouver News. I say it will come in one minute or three minutes and I stand here and wait for almost 10 minutes. More possible bad news for Metro Vancouver Transit users as contract talks involving SkyTrain workers have suddenly collapsed. The breakdown came shortly after negotiations resumed this morning between transit operators and Coast Mountain Bus Company. Obviously, Mr. Vagramov has uh, made some sort of deal with the, the special prosecutor, and unfortunately, the details of that are sealed. A sexual assault charge against Port Moody Mayor Rob Bagramov has been stayed, meaning he will not be prosecuted further over an incident that took place when he was on a date. The special prosecutor says the stay is because Vagramov has successfully completed an alternative measures program, but the specifics of that alternative measures program, not clear. Uh, more than 48 hours after he was fired, the debate about Don Cherry's comments on Hockey Night in Canada are still raging. As Lisa Zing reports, while many take issue with his anti-immigrant comments, some remain very firmly in the coach's corner. If you'd like some signage, just come on over. A small protest in front of the Rogers headquarters today, all supporters of Don Cherry. I think he meant the right thing. I think it came out a little bit wrong. People are just too sensitive today. I really, really do. I think it's beyond do you think ridiculous. They're wrong in what they did. These fans say Rogers shouldn't have forced out Cherry for comments he made Saturday night. You people love you. you they come here, whatever it is. You love our way of life. You love our milk and honey. At least you could pay a couple of bucks for poppies. His co-host, Ron McLean, apologized the next day, and for the first time since then, he told CBC News he will appear without Don on Hockey Night in Canada this weekend. I have to have these days to make sure I'm right in what I say this weekend, uh, to think about uh, all that's going on and process it. Canadians are also processing what happened as the controversy around Cherry's departure has divided the country. There's a left-wing bias. They and some of the sentiments have become vitriolic. Some who've spoken out against Cherry say they've received threats. It's almost like Don Cherry was the spark for this latest debate because people aren't even talking about Don Cherry anymore in all of these arguments I'm seeing. They're just pointing fingers at everybody else and name-calling everybody else. The backlash has also become increasingly political. Nobody had a problem with it until all of a sudden a few protesters or a few public people came out. That's the problem with the left. Perhaps fueling the anger, Cherry appeared on Fox News with right-wing host Tucker Carlson. The two words that, that got it that you people, and as you know, people are very sensitive like that, and that's, uh, they got me. But I, I listen, well, they're not, I, not I mean, prepared. I just clarify, they're not sensitive at all, they're fascists. Meanwhile, the petition calling on Rogers to bring back Don Cherry is still gaining signatures, more than 200,000 and counting. Lisa Sheng, CBC News, Toronto. You're looking at a live shot tonight to BC Place at 6.32 on this Wednesday evening. A few breaks of sun today. Brett says it turned out a lot better than he predicted. But get ready for showers tomorrow. Brett is here to tell us how bad it will be after the break.
mayor of Venice is calling for the Italian city to be declared a national disaster zone. As Margaret Evans explains, he blames climate change for storms causing the worst flooding in half a century. The siren's call of Venice taking on a whole new meaning as floodwaters reach their highest level in 50 years. High water warnings still sounding across the city today. Residents and tourists sloshing through submerged streets in search of higher ground okay? or rubber boots. This is particularly bad. Huge parts of Venice are now underwater. The highest tide hitting overnight in the midst of gusting winds and rain. The floodwaters make for some arresting images, not least a Neptune lookalike swimming in St. Mark's Square. But the famed basilica next to it with its ancient crypt is now submerged beneath a meter of water. The city's mayor calls it a harbinger of things to come. We need everybody to help, he says, and we must be united to face what are clearly the effects of climate change. Venice is a collection of over 100 tiny islands in a lagoon along the Adriatic Sea. Some call it the floating city. Today, its legendary gondolas were either washed up on shore or tethered, fears of potentially higher tides to come. Construction of a flood barrier designed to protect Venice from high tides was begun back in 1984, but it's still not finished and corruption allegations abound. They've done nothing, says this man. In Italy, that's how it is. Our politicians are all thieves. They should be in jail. Local authorities are calling the flooding of Venice a national emergency. Margaret Evans, CBC News, London. Well, the world's most famous teen environmentalist, Greta Thunberg, is waving goodbye to North America as she hitches a ride back to Europe. The 16-year-old Swede set sail from Virginia today, a guest on a catamaran owned by an Australian couple. Thunberg famously refuses to fly because it hurts the environment, and with a UN climate conference looming in Spain, she needed a quick way home. The trip comes after the grade 10 student spent several weeks in Canada and the U.S. Thunberg tweeted to her 3 million Twitter followers as she headed back to Europe. She said thanks for the incredible hospitality and support. She should arrive in about three weeks. Three weeks at sea, that's uh, not exactly a quick trip. No, but, definitely uh, not a quick no, drop, no. but uh, She'll get there. hopefully not the, the greatest weather of weather either. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You never know about that, but yeah, I really feel, again, we lucked out today. As far as November it's days nice. go, mm -hmm. it's nice and warm. That sun came out. Still, again, noticing how low the sun is in the sky these days, but hey, this is the price we pay. Mm -hmm. um, you do want to take a look at what it was like first thing this morning? Because it actually was well worth revisiting once again. You can see the sky's clearing up. I was happy to be wrong about the cloudy forecast that I largely had in place for today, but it was really quite nice, and I have at least a lot more confidence now that we are going to be entering into some more cloudy conditions when we get into tomorrow and essentially later tonight and into the overnight. I promised this yesterday, getting an update as to how much rain we've seen in November so far. Yesterday we saw about 17 millimeters of rain, so we're now up to a whopping 26 millimeters here in Vancouver, and we've only had four rainy days. Compare this to the 186 that Vancouver would be getting in the entire month. So to say that we're a little bit on the dry side, that's uh, a bit of an understatement, but that's gonna be changing up actually fairly quickly as we get into the end of the week. So flashing forward all the way through this evening into the overnight and through much of Thursday, it's really just gonna be a cloudy story. We may see a few breaks of sun first thing in the morning, but I've got my eye specifically around sort of that supper hour. Any between six and nine o'clock, we're gonna look at some showers pushing in and that showers, th those showers rather, that's gonna be changing into some pretty heavy rain and you saw it go by quite quickly there but that means at least for the better part of Friday afternoon and evening it's probably going to be fairly dry at that point. In terms of the totals here, this is definitely something where I was emphasizing we're talking about actual rain as opposed to just a few showers. It's quite likely that we're going to see anywhere between, I would say, 15 and 30 millimeters all the way across the region. So that's going to help boost up those totals a little bit more. The one thing that I am keeping my eye on, though, inconvenient timing for those that enjoy dry weekends, but we are looking at another system that's going to be coming through in time for Saturday. So while this will mean rain for us down here in the lower mainland, if you saw that 
big stretch of blue across the Coast Mountains. Well, finally, I think we're going to be getting a little bit of snow at the upper levels. We're still talking over about 2,000 meters, but hey, we want to get into ski season. At least I do. In terms of our five-day forecast, temperatures still really an impressive story here, looking well above seasonal 12s, 11s, 10s. That's pretty good. But of course, we are going to be seeing the return of those showers this weekend and almost like a fun little joke by Monday. <laughs> feeling pretty good about that sunshine coming back just in time for another work week. Isn't it great how that always works out? Yeah. I swear I don't do it on purpose. A cozy weekend wrapped <laughs> yeah. up in a blanket there on the couch. There you go. Exactly. exactly. All right, Brett, thank you. Uh, Nova Scotians have gathered for an annual ceremony. It's the falling of a giant tree. <laughs> Each year, the province of Nova Scotia gifts a tree to Boston, picking the best needled, tallest and handsomest they can find. So how did the tradition start and why? Yeah, and honestly, how did they end up picking the tree? Well, Brett Ruskin has all of the answers. Well, the quest to find Nova Scotia's nicest Christmas tree has brought forestry officials here to Picto County this year. This is the tree that was cut down and will be trucked down to Boston to be set up in the Boston Common. Again, as always, as with every year, uh, Nova Scotian officials say thank you on an annual basis to the people of Boston for the assistance that they provided following the Halifax explosion. This year, this is the tree, and I was able to speak with the tree owners, the landowners here, uh, who donated this year's tree. The tree had all the characteristics that they were looking for. And uh, when it was selected this year, we were very proud and honored uh, to have it gifted to the people of Boston from us. And so today, hundreds of kids were bussed in from local area schools. The experts cut down the tree. It slowly came down. Again, it didn't fall down so that the branches uh, stayed intact for when it makes its journey down to Boston. Again, 13.7 meters tall. The tree will be trucked 1,100 meters down the highway to Boston, and then it will be lit up with 6,000 lights uh, on a ceremony happening on December 5th. Brett Ruskin, CBC News, Picto County, Nova Scotia. Good looking tree. The big tree. <laughs> I'm and Boston and Halifax have a, a lot of interesting They do. They share a lot of uh, friendships, I think, is a good word for it. Not a good tree. <laughs> well, a tree yeah. is a nice way to show. Definitely. All right. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Well, he used his SUV to protect pedestrians from a speeding car. Now the Montreal man's being called a hero. Why he put his own safety at risk, coming up.
Amy Bell, and here's what's in your CBC Vancouver inbox. If you've ever wondered what it's like behind the scenes here at CBC Vancouver, here's your chance. Go online and book a date to come in for a tour of our integrated newsroom. And our home can be your home. From concerts to galas to bar mitzvahs, our studio space can be transformed for any occasion and is available for rent. For more from CBC Vancouver, check us out online at cbc.ca slash bc. Well, he says what he did was no big deal, but a Montreal man is being called a hero. Yeah, yesterday, his quick thinking likely saved lives because, as Jayla Bernstein reports, Eric Marciano used his SUV as a shield, blocking a speeding car from slamming into a crowd of people. Eric Marciano shrugs off the word hero. He was driving downtown when he saw a police chase unfold in front of him. What he did next, no doubt, saved lives. If you hadn't been there in that moment and done that, what do you think could have happened? I don't know. I don't... I'd rather not think about it. <laughs> this is where Eric Marciano was yesterday at the corner of René Lévesque and Saint-Denis. He saw the car make a U-turn up ahead of him and then come speeding back towards him. That's when he made the split-second decision to swerve his car and protect the pedestrians. And it was really a lot of construction workers and pedestrians, so I figured... I mean, I, I, I made some noise, I honked, and uh, I just turned really quickly and blocked his passage. This was the aftermath. Marciano says he wasn't thinking of his own safety. It didn't, it didn't cross my mind. I have, he had a little, little Honda, no offense, <laughs> and I had a pretty big truck, so it was really not much risk. By now, most of Montreal has heard the story, including Marciano's insurer, who even waived the deductible. They passed me straight to a supervisor, and they were aware of the situation, and uh, they were very... Uh, thankful, I guess. The mayor shared her gratitude as well. I find it amazing that uh, he did this, this move, crushed his car in order to save uh, people's life, possibly people's life. So it's, it, is, it is great. So I thank him. The 19-year-old driver has pleaded not guilty to seven charges, including impaired driving, driving a stolen vehicle and driving with a suspended license. His mother thanked Marciano. She says it could have been much worse. She says for years she's been trying to get help for her son, who has mental health issues. Marciano didn't expect so much attention. He says he just did what felt right. I was there and I did what I had to do. Jayla Bernstein, CBC News, Montreal. A University of Toronto student says she was left feeling like a criminal after her attempt to get help for suicidal thoughts. As Angela King reports, it ended with her being walked across campus in handcuffs. It was very dehumanizing, to be honest, and very scary and confusing. She wanted help but wound up in handcuffs. A friend went with her to see a campus psychiatrist, but they were told it could take months. So she saw a nurse. Together, they came up with a safety plan, which included staying at her friend's house that night. Before she left, the nurse made her speak with campus security. The minute I told them that it was a real location, it was a bridge, but that I would be going to my friend's house, they stopped everything and they told me that I would be put under arrest. They were taking her to a hospital. She says she was calm and told them the handcuffs were unnecessary. She was willing to go. I was bewildered. I couldn't believe that this was happening to my friend who at this point had been so cooperative and she'd been so open. They say the officers covered the cuffs and escorted her through a busy building. I felt like I did something wrong in asking for help. Like truly everyone was looking. Her face was red and she was crying and breathing was very erratic and you know she had just hyperventilated. They say the handcuffs weren't removed until a nurse at the hospital deemed it okay. She spent the night and was prescribed medication. According to one part of the Provincial Mental Health Act, police can transport people to facilities if it's signed off on by a doctor. And although there are no written rules about restraints in those instances, one expert says handcuffs are often used unnecessarily. The main thing to keep in mind in these discussions is this tenuous balancing act between safety versus stigma. She says there are instances that require restraints, but says in university settings, transport should be left to mental health professionals. These types of blanket policies of using law enforcement, marked vehicles, uniformed police, 
and handcuffs are extremely stigmatizing and they can have long-term impacts that are detrimental for someone's mental health and they might not come back to us later to ask for help again when they need it. The school says student safety is the primary concern and that campus police have mental health training and use handcuffs on a case-by-case -case basis. The university is looking at its response to this case and just looking to make sure that we have consistent practices and protocols. Meanwhile, the student has this message. You can have mental health professionals along your side that will not handcuff you, but that are in the profession because they want to help people. Angelina King, CBC News, Mississauga, Ontario. Self-checkouts are designed to make shopping more convenient, but some Walmart customers are upset about being asked to show their bags and receipts at exit. As the CBC's Jacqueline Hansen explains, they think the retailer may be going a step too far. Self-checkout is the lane of choice for many, but at Walmart, Penny Rintoul says it makes her feel like a thief. Not only once, but twice on the self-checkout do they ask you to ensure that you've scanned all your items. But then leaving the store, uh, that loss prevention officer appeared to be checking receipts from everyone. She complained to Walmart on Twitter saying, your loss prevention measures are now officially over the top and making me reconsider shopping in your stores. It's very angering and demeaning. Uh, it seems like they're taking the position that everyone is a potential thief. Other shoppers complained online about ramped up receipt checking as well. One called the process discriminating. Another said she felt like a skis bag being stopped at the door and searched. Walmart responded directly to some of the complaints saying as more of our stores are equipped with self checkout machines, our associates will check receipts to make sure the transaction went smoothly. What is someone's rights in that situation? You can say thanks, but no thanks and walk right out. This lawyer says if shoppers don't agree to a receipt check, employees can't force them. That's an illegal search and uh, they are violating the Human Rights Code. The Canadian Civil Liberties Association says it's launching an investigation into the process of routine security checks. I'm very skeptical. I I'm betting dressed like this, I'm not going to get stopped. Rich people don't get stopped to have their bags checked. Uh, that's racial profiling, that's poverty profiling, that's discrimination. Self-checkouts are creating problems for some retailers. A study in the UK found the new technology can lead to increased theft. The stores know this, but they still see the labor savings as more than compensating for the increased theft rate. Still, additional receipt checks may hurt more than they help, according to this security consultant. It's an annoyance to their customers. It's not doing anything for inventory control. They're not really checking that closely. Rintoul didn't hear back from Walmart. They don't care what people are thinking. This is just something that they're going to do. Walmart didn't respond to our inquiries about shoppers' rights. Instead, it said its policies help the company manage costs and continue to offer low prices. Jacqueline Hansen, CBC News, Mississauga. It's the latest National Historic Site in Canada. After the break, we take you inside Vancouver's Japanese Hall.
They're the most studied and famous whale family in the world. What's pushing J-Pod to the brink? I'm Gloria Makarenko, host of the new CBC British Columbia original podcast, Killers. Is it too late to save them? Thursday on the early edition from housing demolitions to used box springs to old church pews, Vancouver's Woodshop Workers Co-op takes old lumber and gives it new life. They're opening their doors this weekend for the East Vancouver Culture Crawl, and we'll check in. Okay, here's the question. Can you name all of Metro Vancouver's national historic sites? Oh, before you answer... I have an answer. Oh, I thought you might. <laughs> uh, here's the latest addition to that list. <laughs> the Vancouver Japanese Language School and Japanese Hall is being designated a National Historic Site by Parks Canada. It's been in operation since 1906, surviving the dispossession and internment of Japanese Canadians during the Second World War. Many former students were in attendance for the unveiling. It brought tears to my eyes today. Yes, it's uh, it's a real honor. Have you gotten to see that yourself? Meet you know some of the kids and oh, the yes. students. They are just speaking real good Japanese. <laughs> You're impressed with what they're doing. Oh yes, I'm. I'm embarrassed <laughs> <laughs> because I've lost a lot of Japanese myself. Because you know when you lose your parents, you know you don't have that. Time to speak Japanese. That's very nice. Yes. Um, That's so the uh, the answer. Yes. To your question. Can you name, the question was, can you name all of Metro Vancouver's national? Uh, there's not many. Yeah, so Stanley Park, Fort Langley. Stanley Park, Fort Langley. Do you know the third? Mm, how to go on? No, I didn't know this one either. That's it's the do, yeah. Gulf of Georgia, Cannery, in Steveston. Oh really? Mm -hmm. Okay, I did not know that. Did you know any of them? Uh, maybe Stanley Park. <laughs> Fort Langley makes official sense. quiz masters tonight, are you? <laughs> All, right. <laughs> All right, we are going to leave you tonight with uh, some music from a local rap artist, Snotty Nose Reds Kids. They perform today at our Indigenous Junior J School. They're fantastic. I got, I got cars, we was beaters and designers on my team. I got braiders, hella famous, that I'm signing to my team. And my limousine, cause they look steezy. Next to mine, did your queen? Yeah, that's my moose with me. I know, I know bottles, I know chiefs. I know riders from the east. I know educated natives down to pick it in the streets. Middle fingers to police. F you, we come in peace. I know red skin hippies that be giving me the creeps. I know beauty, I know beast. Savages and freaks. I know a couple thousands even bougie yeah, than me. No, 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 we ain't elite. Bougie native, yes indeed. Art exhibit to the club. And we rollin' 20 deep, boy. Powder on my neck, yeah. Gold on my ring, yeah. Feather on my hat, yeah. Skin stitched chin. Hundred warriors on my back. They be drumming when I sing. And there ain't no way to run it.